Hey everybody. So I've been seeing more and more publicity around graph neural networks, knowledge graphs, etc. And I think that is amazing and wonderful. And I want to say to the world, welcome. I've been waiting for you for two years now. So that being said, I think the first question that a lot of people will ask is how exactly did I come up with this and start thinking of these things two years ago as opposed to now when people are just now diving into it. So let me answer that up front, right? So to me, when I first lay eyes on LLM models and I start going into it, the very first thing that struck my mind was I didn't know how the internal workings worked. That bothers me. I'm an engineer. I've had 20 years of IT experience. Like I, I a lot of things about that and saying that I didn't know how LLM models worked, it is a bad statement for me to make personally. I didn't like that statement. So the very first thing that I did was I said, I'm going to spend about six months, literally six months, 20 hours a day sometimes reverse engineering and understanding exactly how this works. And that's exactly what I did. Like I matrix multiplication, how does vectorization work? I built literal LLM models from the ground up. I tore BERT apart, like put BERT back together. Everything that you can think of, like I like to understand exactly how these models work. And then once I did that, I was like, I and I could put them back together again, take it apart, put it back together. I said, okay, what's the weakest link in the chain, right? Because that's the second place that my mind goes. Uh, so I've been trained a lot on a kind of like a assembly line um, mentality. Uh, all of that, right? Like uh, that's a huge part of my career, my success. All of that is taking an approach and systematizing it. And then within that systematization, it's very easy. You just take the weakest link, whatever the weakest link is, is going to be your weakest chain overall. And then you fix that and you fix that and you fix that until your weakest link is very strong, right? And then that cool. And you're good. Very simple, straightforward strategy. So I did the same thing with LM models. I said, what's the weakest link of an LLM model? And then if you do that and you actually understand how LLM models work and you dissect that, the weakest link of a LLM model is very crystal clear to me that it's the word vectorization portion of it. Uh, word vectorization sacrifices accuracy. That's the simplest way that, that I can put it overall. Uh, word vectorization, it sacrifices, I'd say uh, like on average about 85 to 90% accuracy. Uh, what does that mean in actual non-mathematical terms? Let's take a simple word, like the cat sat on the mat. In word vectorization terms, what the cat sat on the mat is vectorized into, let's say, two, one, 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 one. And that would be that one version, one word vectorization version of the cat sat on the mat, two, one, 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 one. That is not very accurate overall, right? How exactly you get the cat sat on the mat from two, one, 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 one is a very large stretch to me. Uh, again, it's it's not an accurate, right? but somehow the models are able to take that slim amount of information and then they're able to say, hey, that equals, I think, in 90% of instances, the cat sat on the mat and then they end up being right. And then that's how it works, right? But so just very simplistically, I said, okay, like that, that's a simple, like I, I can understand that. So what if you just sacrifice less accuracy than that? <laughs> like, okay, like uh, the, the, the low mark is 21111. All I have to do is do better than that, right? Uh, and then so I start diving into it, and then the very first thing that I come across is fractals. Uh, and then I've, I learned later that like, like when people start diving into this, for whatever reason, fractals is always where they go. It's like... Um, the mind naturally gravitates towards this for whatever reasons, right? Like what I'm, I'll leave it philosophically there, but like, like that's the always like it's, it's uh, not just throwing water into a pond, right? This is the like, same conclusion that everyone draws when you start diving into these, you understand these equations and then you start diving into it. It's like, okay, fractals is the easy answer. So that's where my mind went to, right? Uh, and I'm like, okay, fractals. And then I start playing around with them. Uh, and then, what I realized is like when you start, when you do this word vectorization process, this tokenization process, you run into a mathematical problem with geometric fractals uh, and this process. You can't do it. <laughs> it's essentially the bottom line, right? Like you can get very close to it. You can get super close. And I think that's what gets people excited, right? Because it's like you can get like 90% of the way there. The problem is I can I can clearly articulate the problem to you is, is that 
there's no way to sacrifice accuracy within geometry. Like it's not a form of math that does that. And then so that's the problem that you run into with word vectorization and fractals uh, when you run into this as a geom geometric problem, right? And then so simply putting this into like a, like very simplistic terms, right? So the cat sat on the mat. Let's fractalize that sentence, right? So then if we fractalize the cat sat on the mat, a fractal of the cat could be um, great at seeing at night, hunts mice, uh, whiskers. Those are all fractals of cat, right? They're characteristics that make up cat. Uh, the problem is, is, is that so if you do that in geometry, then you get unlimited fractals and it's uh, explosion. And then so if you run that into a computer, the computer has no way to handle that. Like, uh, and then even if you put limits on it, it doesn't, it doesn't work right. Like you can't just say, give me like 10 fractals uh, or give me like 15 fractals. Like it, it, it's like all or nothing, right? On or off uh, with like when you're doing it within geometric terms. And then this is all known as like, a, this is a, a known unsolvable problem within, within geometry. <laughs> like this is a uh, problem lots of people have run into it. Like if you get into, again, you get into uh, accuracy in math, right? Which is, it's very, like to me, I think that this is where a, a lot of this comes in is because like up until AI models, I don't think a lot of people cared about accuracy in math. Like you always wanted math to be 100% accurate, right? Like I want two plus two to equal four. That's, that's uh, there's no accuracy problems within that, right? Uh, but then with uh, like, <laughs> unless you're a certain person, uh, but uh, then there's, uh, but there are areas and aspects of math that deal with accuracy uh, and then sacrificing accuracy. And then so uh, you do want to get into those things. And then so when you start diving deeper into that, you realize that you can't do it with geometry, right? Just flat out. And then so, uh, I, when I start diving into this, right, I start diving into it, I run into that accuracy problem, and I, I, I didn't know at the time that it's unsolvable within geometry. Like, I probably would have stopped there if I knew that, right? <laughs> uh, but so, so I get it, and I hit it. I'm like, I, I can almost get it. It's just I can't sacrifice the accuracy, right? Uh, and then so I start thinking about it, and I'm like, how can I sacrifice the accuracy? At this point, and in this moment in time, I'm playing around a lot with calculus as well, right? So I'm getting really heavy into first order predicate calculus and higher order logic, which if you start, if you look at my math for PFAF, like, and how it all, like, I just give you the, like, 90% of it, right? It's higher order logic and first order predicate calculus. Uh, it's like a, a huge portion of the math behind this, uh, because that's how I'm able to sacrifice the accuracy. Uh, and then so what I do is say uh, the cat sat on the mat, same thing, right? And then we take a fractal of the cat, but then what I'm able to do is I'm able to give it certain dimensions. I can get say, give me five dimensions, give me five fractal dimensions of cat, give me 10 fractal dimensions of cat, etc. And then what happens is, is that you're shaving off um, characteristics of, of cat in this instance, right? Like you're, like uh, you're, you're, uh, making the concept lossy. That's the best way that I can put it, right? So if the cat equals like every single characteristic that makes up a cat, we shave off like 10% of the characteristics that make up a cat, maybe 15% of the characteristics that make up a cat. But it's still like, we still like whiskers, hunts mice, sees great at, at night. Like all of the essential elements that are needed are there, right? We just like, uh, maybe like uh, it's a particular genus and it's a particular family, right? Like we, we shave that off. Like, cause it's like at that point when you have all the rest of the characteristics, like you don't need that, right? And then, so that's the type of accuracy that we're shaving off, but that's literally what we're doing within the mathematical equation within PFAF. And that's why PFAF works where geometric fractals are running into, are going to and are running into these issues, right? Like, so you see like a lot of people now going hard onto knowledge graphs and uh, graph neural networks because they work, right? And they do a lot of stuff. And that's exactly why I created this in the first place. Like my, I created all of this to test that assumption, which is why I've known the, the answer to the question up front because I already tested it, right? And then my theory was, uh, if none of this works, then the models don't actually learn anything. If this works like even like 1%, then there's something going on there. And then it, it works better than, more surprising than, than I thought it would, right? It works like really good. <laughs> and so there's something going on there, right? Uh, what is going on there? I'll leave it up to you. But so uh, I just cracked this.
code that this works. <laughs> and so uh, here it is very simplistically for you and just kind of just breaking it down for you. If you like the next step that I would take for here from here is if you go to my hugging face, I have like the PFAF 750 data set. You can look at my data sets that I utilize for PFAF and like for some of it, I hold some of it back, but like uh, the PFAF equation and, and a lot of that. And then it's, I have, I built out the full encoder decoder. I built out every single aspect of this, right? PFAF is literally built to replace word vectorization in this instance. It's you, everything that you need for knowledge graphs, for graph neural networks. I thought all through this two years ago, right? I've thought through every single step that you're going through now, which is why like, I, I'm just sitting back watching the world go through these things. And I'm making this video now because I know the challenge that you're gonna run into is this particular problem with geometry and trying to sacrifice accuracy. You're gonna notice that graph neural networks are, are great, they're amazing, they work like 80%, but they're not gonna work 100%, and then you're not gonna figure out why they're not working 100%, and it's because you can't sacrifice accuracy within, within geometry, but you can't within calculus. Uh, and then so, uh, if you want to talk further about PFAF, if you want to train your models on PFAF, uh, or if you just simply like this type of content, please like and subscribe, thank you very much.